So yesterday in class, we talked about the beginning process of breaking down glucose and recovering the energy stored in the chemical bonds between the carbons. So the first step in breaking down glucose into pyruvate is called what? Glycolysis. Within which organelle does glycolysis occur? It's kind of a tricky way to ask that question, but the cytoplasm. So just inside the cell in the cytoplasm. Cytosol, cytoplasm, same. Same thing. I'm good with either one. Now, what is one very simple, practical, logical reason that we have to do part of this metabolic process in the cytoplasm before we finish it in the mitochondria? Let me ask it this way. Why would you necessarily take a piece of furniture apart before you move it into your apartment? It might not fit. It's too big. And that's why we're breaking down glucose in the cytoplasm. It's too big to be transported into the mitochondria. So that's a very practical, simple reason why that's accomplished. The other reason, also sort of a logistical situation, you have the enzymes that are responsible for those first 10 steps, the steps of our glycolysis, they're in the cytoplasm, not in the mitochondria. And likewise, the steps we're going to go through now with aerobic respiration are in the mitochondria, not in the cytoplasm. So notice we have glycolysis, then we've got our TCA cycle, citric acid, but we do have an intermediate step between the formation of pyruvate and the citric acid cycle, and you see this acetyl-CoA. So that's the first thing we need to discuss before we get into the, the remainder of our respiration. What is acetyl-CoA? Acetyl-CoA is formed from pyruvate. And again, this is going to be the transition step as we're moving from cytoplasm into mitochondria. So CoA is coenzyme A much like we had the cofactor NAD, now we have this other cofactor. And so here we have coenzyme A, and it's going to come together and form a structure with pyruvate. And in the process, what are we doing to NAD? Just like in glycolysis, we're going to oxidize, we're capturing some electrons, but notice, for the very first time, what are we giving off as we're processing our material? We're losing a molecule of carbon dioxide. Now, per glucose molecule, how many carbons are lost before we go into the mitochondria and before we go into the citric acid cycle? Be careful, it's a trick question. When you bring glucose in and we're breaking glucose down, before we go on to our next step, how many carbons are we losing from glucose before we start our citric acid cycle? None. We're losing the carbons, but how many? Two. Why? Because we got two pyruvates per every glucose. So even though we're seeing pyruvate, remember how many carbons does pyruvate have? Three. How many pyruvates are produced per glucose molecule? Two. That, that gives us our six carbons. But now, as we're taking those pyruvates, combining them with CoA, forming acetyl-CoA, for each pyruvate, we're losing the carbon as carbon dioxide. We do it twice. So now we have taken our six carbon glucose, and what we have left are two two carbon acetyl CoAs that we're going to plug into the citric acid cycle. That's the transition step then to get us into this beast. Again, don't panic. I see it in your face. Don't panic. Because what have we what have we been doing? What did we do yesterday? 
We simplified it. We're keeping track of our carbons. So here as we're plugging in to the TCA cycle in this graphic, very complex graphic, here's our acetyl-CoA, and remember we're doing it twice per glucose molecule. We're taking our acetyl-CoA and we're plugging it into the TCA cycle and we're combining our acetyl-CoA, two carbon molecule, with a product of the TCA cycle called oxaloacetate. Now oxaloacetate is always going to be that intermediate in our TCA cycle that accepts the acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA, two carbons. Oxaloacetate, four carbons. And so when we put this together, we have citrate. Citrate is now a six carbon molecule, which is kind of weird. You started with six carbon glucose. You broke it down into two carbons. Now we've reassembled it back together into a six carbon molecule. So just like moving that big piece of furniture, you took it apart, brought it in, to your apartment, reassembled it together. But in this case, it's not reassembled exactly the same. It's not the same glucose molecule. It's a different six carbon molecule that we can now process and recover all of the energy that remained in those bonds between the glucose. And so as we go through our steps, here's our first step, the combining of acetyl-CoA with oxaloacetate. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight steps in this cycle. And what we're going to really be looking for, following the carbons, looking for the ATP that are produced. And as we go through our citric acid cycle, we're going to see the production of ATP. Now, is this a substrate level? phosphorylation or is it an oxidative phosphorylation step? It's just like in glycolysis, this is considered substrate level phosphorylation. The only place you see oxidative phosphorylation is at the very end of this process in the mitochondria with ATP synthase. If it's any place else, it's substrate level. So we're going to see we make ATP, but we're also capturing electrons, reducing our cofactors. There's our NAD being produced. There's some more NAD being produced. And we're going to have another that is called FAD. FAD is also going to be a cofactor that can capture electrons. And we use that one also in our TCA cycle. Does that look better? Much, much better. So there's pyruvate. We're going to combine pyruvate. We're going to break it down to what, was, what did we say is going to enter the TCA cycle? Acetyl. Acetyl-CoA. Two carbons. But we're not following the carbons in this illustration. We're following where the energy is going. So here we have our NADH electrons. Remember, it's going to be two per glucose molecule one per pyruvate. <clears throat> we form our citrate. We come on around in our step three, there's some more electrons. Step four, we got electrons. Step five, substrate level production of ATP. And in step six, we're going to capture more electrons. And there's our different cofactor, FADH2. And then our oxaloacetate, we're going to capture some more electrons before we start the process again. So prior to getting to the last oxidative phosphorylation step, all of our energy so far is present as electrons, not ATP. Until when? Into electrons that we've captured. You said until? Until we get to the last, the electron transport oxidative phosphorylation step. Okay. See, this is still all just the eight steps of our TCA cycle. Yeah, so until we finish the TCA cycle, okay. here we're breaking down all of the remaining carbons that we have brought in from glucose. We've captured the electrons, and that's primarily where we're going to have this energy in the form of those electrons.
Because how many ATP have we produced at the end of the TCA cycle? How many electrons have we netted in our breakdown of glucose? First of all, glycolysis. How many ATP did we net produce? Net produce, two. Gross is four, but remember we had to use two. And glycolysis, everything's two. Two pyruvate, two ATP, and two NADH. So we've got two from glycolysis. How many ATP are we going to have produced from the TCA cycle per glucose molecule? Two. See, this is for pyruvate. Remember, we've got two pyruvate. So <coughs> we're only going to have net produced two molecules of ATP so far. But in this overall process, we're going to produce in the neighborhood of 34 ATP per glucose. So this last step that's coming up, oxidative phosphorylation step, that's where we're going to make the most ATP using the energy of the electrons. All right? So this is following our carbons now. Remember pyruvate had three. Each pyruvate gives off that one to give us our two carbon acetyl-CoA. Notice I'm not putting the names up here, but you hear me saying them, right? So use little tricks like numbers, symbols to trigger you to remember these other, other more important parts. Acetyl-CoA, that's, that's a really important name as we go through this. Oxaloacetate, that's going to accept the acetyl-CoA. Remember that name. And then what is produced when you combine acetyl-CoA with oxaloacetate? Citrate. Citrate. That, that entering the cycle, that's an important part. These other intermediates, I'm not so worried about them. But what I want you to do is be able to follow the carbons. So two of, our, well, four total from our glucose are now entering the TCA cycle. There's our oxaloacetate bringing four gives us a new six carbon molecule to play with, that being citrate. Now, as we get to step three, where we capture some ele electrons, poof, there goes another carbon. And I like to imagine that's some of the original carbon from that glucose that came in here. So we had three, we got knocked down to two. We only have one carbon left from our original glucose cycling around through here. And in step four, again, where we have more electrons popping off, that's where we lose that last electron. So you see oxaloacetate with these four, by the time we get through step four, that's all we have left. We have lost the two electrons that we brought in to the TCA cycle originally. At least that's how I like to think of it. It may not necessarily be exactly the same ones. So we've got our energy capture in the electrons and in our substrate level ATP. We see we've lost the carbons, and we're just going to recycle this again and again and again as we bring in the pyruvate acetyl-CoA to keep this whole cycle spinning. Any questions? Because again, you, you, don't, you don't have to study that. That would take days, weeks, to study that. Just make it simple. Because that's what you need to know. In addition to the names, right? Oxaloacetate, acetyl-CoA, citrate. Um, are the names of the ones that we need to know on the other slide? Oh, sure. The, the busy slide, yeah. I mean, here we've got uh, uh, acetyl-CoA. I mean, they just have that abbreviated coenzyme A there, COA. There's oxaloacetate. There's citrate. I mean, we can, we can go on around. You know, they've got all the names, uh, succinyl-CoA and, uh, yeah. That's just real busy, so, like, that's why you did the other one. Correct. But, again, all these intermediates, I'm, I'm not so interested in them, but where you're plugging in here with the oxaloacetate, citrate, and the acetyl-CoA, that's, that's important to get that started. Any other questions? Good question. 
So when we look at the TCA cycle, here are our products. From the step one to step four, two NAD, two CO2 released. When we get to TCA5, that's where our substrate level ATP is coming from. Step six, we get FAD, oxidized, capturing more electrons. Step eight, another NADH, and OAA is abbreviation for oxaloacetate. <clears throat> That's just a standard abbreviation. So again, this is sort of a little more summary of what we see from this slide with what is being produced. But really, when we get to the end point, what are the products then <coughs> of the citric acid cycle? And we're going to add those to the products of glycolysis. This is uh, flavine adenine dinucleotide. Is that uh, riboflavin adenine dinucleotide? So that's FAD. So we've got our FAD. We're going to pick up those two electrons, two hydrogens, and that's the reduced form uh, of FADH2, our electron carrier, that's going to go on and donate those electrons in our electron transport chain. So NAD picks up one, FAD can pick up two. It's twice as good. Correct. NAD just does one. So TCA cycle summary. Glycolysis, the big one was number two, right? Two pyruvates, two ATP, and two NADH. Now when we look per glucose molecule, and, and you can do per acetyl-CoA, but I like to look at per glucose, we're going to produce four CO2s, which is those last four carbons we brought in, because remember we lost two of them making acetyl-CoA. We're going to bring in uh, six NADH, two FADH2, and two more ATP. But do not forget that we're going to have two more NADH in that transition step before, between glycolysis and the TCA cycle. So at the end of the TCA cycle, how many molecules of CO2 have we produced? Starting with glucose, going through glycolysis and TCA, how many carbon dioxides have we produced? Six. We've completely broken down glucose. See, here's where we're going to get rid of two, and then we're going to get rid of the other four through our cycle. Again, you're having to think double as we do that. So six NADHs in TCA. How many NADHs did we get from glycolysis? Two. So that's eight, right? But we have to add two more because of what's happening here with our acetyl-CoA. So in fact, from glucose through the TCA cycle, we have 10 NADHs. We're just going to have the two FADHs, and we're going to have two more ATP that we can add to the two that we got from glycolysis. So we're going to have products per glucose through glycolysis through the TCA cycle, you're going to have six CO2s, 10 NADHs, two FAD, and four ATP. That's our net production all the way through TCA from one molecule of glucose. Well, the gross will be the same, just two more ATP. That, that would be the only difference. Everybody hear that? If you want to know the gross, it would still be those same numbers, but the ATP would only be increased by two. That, that would be it. And it's that thing that happened in glycolysis. So is the TCA cycle the same for like when, when you look at plants and animals, the citric acid cycle is going to be very similar, if not identical. It's going to be the electron transport, this next part, that's going to differ between plants and animals. <clears throat> 
And if I'm not mistaken, plants also have a different electron carrier. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I think plants have a one more kind of coenzyme cofactor other than the FADH2s and the NADHs. But I can't remember. Do you, Botany, do you remember anything about electron carriers other than FAD and NAD? Uh, it seems like there's one more. I'll see if I can find out what I'm thinking about and say something on Monday. Yeah, and maybe that's what I'm thinking of. And that'll be in the next chapter. We'll get to that after our break. Mm, that's going to drive me crazy until I can remember. All right. So just as we saw that we could plug other substrates into glycolysis, we can plug other substrates into our TCA cycle. So we can take our proteins, break them down into amino acids, and amino acids can be plugged in at acetyl-CoA. And when we plug into acetyl-CoA and run through our metabolic pathway, we're going to produce these amine derivatives. And this nitrogenous waste, that's the thing that can build up into these things called ketone bodies and can really cause your blood to become more acidic. It's called ketoacidosis. And that's one of the pitfalls of going to our low-carb, no-carb diets if you're, if you're not careful. We can also plug our lipids in, fatty acids, glycerols. They can come into acetyl-CoA as well, come through our cycle. And then, of course, our sugars, that's our normal pathway coming through glucose, fructose, all the ones we looked at with glycolysis yesterday. So once again, here is glycolysis through TCA. There's our 2NAD, two FADs, our four ATP molecules. And we have completely gotten rid of our carbons that we brought in with the glucose. Completely broken it down, recovered the energy. What is PI? That's, that's just the inorganic phosphates. We're going to stick one of these on one of these to make our ATP. So at this point, as we mentioned before, the bulk of our energy is going to be tied up in these 12 coenzymes, the NAD and the FAD. That's where we have the bulk of the energy because so far we've only gotten four net ATP produced at the substrate level. So now in the next part of our metabolism, we're going to recover the energy from our cofactors. And that's going to be in our electron transport chain. Here we are in the mitochondria, right? Glycolysis, cytoplasm, cytosol. Transition to acetyl-CoA, cytosol. Once we get in the mitochondria, this is where we have to start paying a little bit more attention to exactly where we are. Because remember, inside the mitochondria, we have two compartments. You have the innermost compartment that is referred to as the, the matrix of the mitochondria. And then we have the inner membrane space. Because how many membranes does a mitochondria have? Two membranes, the inner and the outer. The inner membrane is folded up into these structures that we call the cristae. Anytime you see folds in biological systems, what is the first thing you should be thinking is the reason for the folds? Surface increasing surface area, bless you. And the reason we're increasing the surface area is because we have a lot of transport transmembrane proteins embedded in the inner membrane that's going to help us recover the energy from these electrons. The more membrane we have, the more proteins we can put in, the more energy we can process and recover. But we're also going to see it's important to have this inner membrane space because we are going to build up a gradient of ions. And when we build up this gradient of ions, as they flow from that inner membrane space back into the matrix, that's going to be analogous to the water behind a hydroelectric dam. As gravity pulls that water through the turbines in the dam, 
and is released downstream, that gravity pulling the water is going to be the same as our concentration gradient. Our ions are going to be like the high water. They're going to flow through one of these proteins in the membrane. And as they flow through by diffusion because of their gradient, that concentration gradient, that's going to provide the energy that's going to be used as it spins around, and it physically spins around, to link a phosphate with an ADP to produce ATP and a bunch of ATP. So that's sort of the, the purpose for having all of these. Now, the TCA cycle, that's going to be happening in the matrix of the mitochondria. And in fact, after we transport pyruvate in, that transition to acetyl-CoA, that's also happening in the matrix of the mitochondria. So now all of our cofactors except for the ones that were produced during glycolysis, and you can see that's going to be pumped in as well. <coughs> All of those oxidized cofactors are brought in, and we're going to use those then in what we refer to as the electron transport chain. Because when you look at the metabolism of glucose, we've got glycolysis, we have TCA, and this is the third big one, electron transport oxidative phosphorylation. I'm kind of ignoring that little transition to acetyl-CoA, but that happens too. So in this last big portion, here we have the inner membrane of our mitochondria. Think of it happening on the cristae. Here's our matrix. Here's our inner membrane space. What we're bringing in to begin this process are our electrons. So here are our electrons, the NADH, uh, FADH2 is also getting plugged in. I don't think they have that illustrated here, but uh, I think the FADH is going to be plugging electrons in here. But we have these complexes of these membrane proteins. You can see complex 1, complex 3, complex 4, and then we have this last big one. This is our ATP synthase on the right-hand side. We have a lot of proteins that are present here. A lot of them are referred to as cytochromes. So if you, if you hear of cytochrome C, that's going to be part of our uh, complex three. But the names are not as critical as what's happening here. When you get these cofactors that are oxidized and have those electrons, you can see that they are donating their electrons to this first complex of electron acceptors and electron transporters. And as these cofactors are donating the electrons, you see that they become NAD or FAD again. But in addition to donating the electrons, as the electrons are donated, that energy is being used to transport hydrogen ions, H plus you see, hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space. So as you donate the electron, it's going to be passed like a bucket brigade. Hand over hand over hand is passed from this complex through a series, uh, again, of cofactors. Then we get to our complex three. The electrons are transferred again. There's cytochrome C over to, to this last complex of electron transport proteins. And the very last thing that happens in this final step of electron transport is those electrons are put together with oxygen and hydrogens to form water. If you do not have oxygen, this whole process backs up and stops. So as long as you have oxygen, what kind of respiratory steps are we talking about? aerobic respiration. And when this shuts down in the mitochondria, pyruvate stays in the cytoplasm and we have to break down that into lactate in the cytoplasm because it's not going to get imported in. It's not going to ship in because it's not being broken down. We're not undergoing aerobic respiration through our electron transport. So is the lactate the same? No, lactate just builds up in your blood. It's just moving the pyruvate out of the way in the form of lactate. 
Yes, yeah, so all of those electrons, the energy we capture from glucose, except for those four ATP, they're being placed into the electron transport chain. And as the electrons are moved down the chain, more and more hydrogen ions, these protons, are getting pumped out into the intermembrane space. Do you see these numbers? Four hydrogens there. We've got six hydrogens all together being pumped out there. We've got two hydrogens being pumped out there. When you collect them all together, that's 10 hydrogen ions per electron that's coming in. Well, two electrons coming in. And when you think of all, we had 12 of those cofactors. So that's going to be a ton of hydrogens, right? The reason that we're building up all the hydrogens in this space is the reason we capture water behind a hydroelectric dam so that we can control its release and gravity can pull the water through those big turbines to produce electricity. Think of it exactly the same because now we've got this gradient, a lot of protons in the space, fewer protons in the matrix. Now we have a channel through which those protons can flow and it's called ATP synthase. And as the energy of that gradient, the movement of the protons move through here, it's going to spin that synthase around molecularly. And that energy of the spinning, the energy of that gradient, is going to cause a phosphate to be added to the ADP, and you produce ATP. ATP synthase. And we're, we're going to talk about it in more detail. So what's the point of capturing the energy from glucose, storing it in the form of electrons, passing it along the electron transport chain? The whole point of that is to build up a gradient of hydrogens so that they can flow back through this enzyme to produce ATP. That's, that's the whole point. That's a long way to get from glucose and all those metabolic steps, but every one of your cells is doing this every minute of every day or else we wouldn't be here. Now this illustration gets at our energy. And as we see, we start out with NADH. And as we follow our electron transport chain, we're going to see that by the time we get to the end and we combine those electrons with oxygen and, and uh, hydrogen to form water, what are we basically doing? Look at, our, look at our delta G. We're going from a high delta G to a low delta G. And when we take this number, we subtract this from that, what is our number going to be, positive or negative? It's going to be negative. What kind of reaction? Exothermic. We're giving off energy, and we're giving off energy and capturing it in the form of ATP. So do you see, we, we can, I mean, we're still working with the delta Gs, we're working with the energies, but it sort of helps you understand that this handoff from protein to protein to protein is not on a straight line. It's kind of like rolling the ball down a hill to the next person, to the next person, to the next person. And that energy then in these complexes is being used to pump those hydrogens out. That's the whole point. Get the hydrogens out, build that gradient up, so they can flow back through. So here we're going to examine a little bit more closely our ATP synthase. And when we look at our NADH, when we look at the liver, kidney, heart, those cells are very efficient at ATP production in the sense that from one NADH, we can produce three ATP molecules. But in some other cells, we're only going to get two ATP from a single NADH molecule. Plants, okay, you, you start with <coughs> glycolysis. In glycolysis, they get the two ATP per NAD. But in the TCA cycle, somehow plants can ramp that up, and they can produce three. So it's not symmetrical between glycolysis and TCA in plants, yet it is in animals. Don't ask me to explain how that works. And then the FADH2, we're going to get two ATP from the FADH regardless of the cells. So there's a little bit of variability 
in how we can capture the energy in those electrons and make ATP, depending on the cells and depending on this reaction that we're having in plants. So there's our illustration again, but this is just a reminder of what we've talked about before we get to this. This sort of puts it into motion. If you follow the NAD, NADPH, that's, I think, the plant one. Okay. Maybe the P stands for plant. Am I that? Yeah. No, okay. See, but that's how my brain works. It's like, if that's in plants, that's why it's a P. It's in plants. So we bring, we bring in the electrons. And you see how the electrons are getting transported along in this sort of purple line. There's cytochrome C. So that's the electrons coming into oxygen to make water. And then the red, that's going to be our protons. And you see how they're building up more and more and more until you have this big line. That's the heavy gradient flowing back through our ATP synthase. And I like how they've even got that spinning around. It, it's just like a little spinning wheel. And as that spins around, we're pumping in a DP. We're pumping in inorganic phosphate. That's both coming in. And what are we pumping out? ATP. Yeah. So that's the process that's being driven by NAD, the electrons. And it's the process by which, for it to continue, we've got to be removing the electrons with oxygen. If we don't have NAD or if we don't have oxygen, that whole business shuts down. Are we good? Electron transport. Now, a little bit more, our F1, F0. Those are the two portions of our ATP synthase. Now, once again, this is going to be on the inner membrane. It's going to be present in those folds of the cristae. And as we look at what can happen with this F0, F1 portions of our ATP synthase, we see that we do have portions that spin around, but it's this F1 portion that's going to be the one that is it twirls and spins around. That's where we see the addition of the phosphate to the ADP into ATP. We've got the, the core here that's sticking up from the F1 into the F0, and the F0 really is going to be the channel through which the protons are funneled. So I like to think of the F0 as the funnel and the F1 is the machine, if that, makes, if that makes sense. So here would be the F1 portion. And as you see, we're bringing in, and, and that's sort of illustrating the rotation that's happening. As we rotate, we bring in ADP and a phosphate, and then it gets spit out. Here we're bringing in an ADP and a phosphate, and it gets ejected. It gets ejected. So for every 120 degrees of rotation, we produce one ATP, which means one complete cycle, we get three. Now, in some cells, remember, that drops down to two per. But you can actually see the physical moving around of that molecule. To, to me, it's amazing how that stuff works. I mean, it really is. All right, so anybody like accounting, balancing a checkbook? Okay, good, I don't either. But we're going to follow and keep track of everything that's happening for our glucose molecules. So if we look at CO2, okay, no CO2 producing glycolysis. This they're calling, that's what I call the transition step, the pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. We're producing two CO2 per glucose molecule. The rest, we break down in our TCA cycle. NADs, we're going to have two, two, and there we get our six for NAD. Now, this is sort of illustrating the ATP per NADH. You remember in animal cells, and this, this darker number is animal cells. Depending on what cell type we have, we can produce the, either the three versus the two. We get three from glycolysis, and we put three 
for TCA. There's our FAD. The only place we're getting our FADH2 is going to be here in the TCA cycle. ATP per FAD is just a straight up 2. Substrate level phosphorylation. Remember, that's everything except ATP synthase. Everything except oxidative phosphorylation. So we produce 2 ATP in glycolysis, 2 ATP. Now, since we put 2, is that gross or net? Net. 2 net. Remember, our gross production is 4. We use 2. So that is our net production. So when we look at our NADH, that means ATP for our final oxidative phosphorylation step, the ATP synthase, we're going to produce from the ATP and glycolysis between four and six molecules of ATP. Just in this breakdown from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we're going to produce six ATP. And then in the TCA cycle, that's where we get a lot of those electrons and we produce the 22. So now, add up our substrate level phosphorylation with our oxidative phosphorylation, and we're going to see that we can produce upwards of 38 molecules of ATP per glucose. So this is, this is maximum ATP yield. All right, it's just separating the blue from this. We're just adding the, so the blue added up to give us these colors, and then these two added up to give us the purple colors at the bottom. All right. So, man, upwards of 36 to 38 ATP per glucose molecule. That's a lot. And where did that energy that we have now in our 38 ATP, where did that originally come from? The sun. It originally came from the sun. So there's our glycolysis 2, Krebs cycle 2, substrate level. Add in about 34 ATP, poof. Maximum number around 38. Yes. 38. Stick with 38. Don't, don't worry about the plants. Don't worry about the different cell types. 38. So if we want to look at it like just a chemical reaction, chemical formula, so our six carbon glucose, we have six oxygen molecules. And what are the oxygens? Where do we use those in this whole process? At the very end. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor to keep the whole thing moving. So glucose plus oxygen. We bring in our ADP and the inorganic phosphate. We are going to yield six carbon dioxide molecules, six molecules of water, and there are 38 ATP that we've captured all the energy from glucose with. Now, as you can imagine, with all this stuff happening in the mitochondria, we, we've got to get the ATP out, right? The rest of the cell is going to need ATP. But to make ATP, we've got to shuffle in our ADP. See, we're bringing ADP in as we shift ATP out. We've got to bring in phosphates. So there are a lot of other transport molecules and transport proteins that are in this inner membrane rather than just our ATP synthase and electron transporters. There's a lot of traffic moving in and out of the mitochondria. It makes sense, though. You've got to have these different components before you can build everything up. Now, in this case, we have sort of a specialized transporter. It's called the glycerol phosphate shuttle. So see what's happening here. Here we have our glycerol phosphate shuttle. So here's our glycerol, uh, glycerol 3-phosphate. So remember our um, dihydroxyacetone phosphate at the end of that very first cleavage preparation step of glycolysis. We had the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. There's our glycerolide 3-phosphate. That's 
what moves on to the next step. But in this case, we can bring this in. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, it's going to go through this other enzyme in the mitochondrial membrane. And look what's happening. This, this cycles around, and in doing so, it can yield some FADH2s, just a very little bit of FADH2s. So if we're slowing down the process of aerobic respiration, we can, in fact, cycle this back through. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate comes in, produce some FADH2. We come in here, but what's one of the negative consequences of that? We're yielding some electrons here, but we're having to use them to keep this cycle going. So in this sense, this is a way that you could continue moving the process when you're getting to the point of really slowing down oxidative respiration, but you're doing it at a cost. You're not really gaining anything net. I mean, you've got two electrons here, and you're using one, so you're netting one electron, but that one's still better than nothing. But you're not going to do this for long, and it's not going to be a great way to really get a lot of work done either.